The advice and opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we're excited to be coming to you for the first time on a holiday. Uh, we hope that we have this figured out and that you're watching us on Memorial Day. Uh, we are, this is a recorded episode so that we could all be enjoying the holiday, but we wanted for you to have a, a new episode. So we're really excited that you're here with us this morning. Uh, you can still be writing in questions. I'm going to try to be available at this time on Memorial Day so that I can be writing in with you so that if you want to write things in, you can. Uh, the website is autism-live.com if you want to be putting things into the chat or you can be... Uh, the best place that I will be looking for questions for this show is on Facebook if you have the opportunity on Facebook. Um, I'll try to check in a little bit on YouTube as well, but Traven's starting to show you some of the places where you can watch the show and where you can comment and all of those things. Uh, our homepage is autism-live.com and there is a chat feature there and other ways to look at all kinds of videos that we've recorded in the past and um, I think that it's much better than our previous website, but if there are things that you would like to see added to it, make sure that you write to us because we are very interested in hearing from you. Your thoughts, feelings, concerns about pretty much anything. <laughs> it doesn't even have to be about the, the website or about autism, but we love talking with you guys. We, uh, on the show, our mission is to be informational and inspirational, and I know for sure I have that for you today on this wonderful Memorial Day. So we like to start on Mondays with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. This is when we take on one word, one phrase, one acronym. We try to figure out just what, in fact, are those experts talking about? Is it something that's useful to us, something that we want to take with us? So today, our jargon term is adaptive skills. You will hear people talk about this in the school setting. They will say, oh, well, we really need to be working on adaptive skills or they'll say that in conjunction with ABA they'll say oh well we're working right now on adaptive skills right and for me it can be a little bit it was for many years that was a very confusing thing for me because I was like what are we talking about uh, I felt like adaptive was things like uh, assistive technology right I didn't understand exactly what they were talking about with adaptive so let's nail it down shall we so the actual definition for adaptive Adaptive skills is age-appropriate behaviors necessary for people to live independently and to function safely and appropriately in daily life. Now, usually we like to make fun of definitions, but as you can see, there's very little there. It's a pretty straightforward, uh, but I, but you know, you go age appropriate. What's an age appropriate behavior for a three-year-old, and what's an age appropriate behavior for a five-year-old? So let's take a look at our working definition, and then we'll start to get a little bit better uh, handle on this. So adaptive skills is real-life skills such as grooming, dressing, safety, safe food handling, school rules, ability to work, money management, cleaning, making friends, social skills, personal responsibility. So a lot of times when we look at adaptive skills skills for a three-year-old, what we're talking about are things that are potty training, being able to zip and button and um, not quite tying shoelaces yet at three, right? But um, being able to wipe their own tuchus, right? Um, that's an adaptive skill. And those are all the things that we, and there's so many more, right? But think about all the things um, I just came back from being at a center and watching kids deal with the lunch stuff and I was amazed at how independent these kids were um, because they're right there working with therapists. But at three, my son could not have opened a milk carton or you know put the straw into a, a pouch 
to drink something. Um, you know, he was just starting to use a fork at three, right? So all of those things are skills that you can work on with someone to get them to be age appropriate. There's a whole schedule of, of these things that talks about when are the years, that, when is the time that we see this skill begin to emerge in somebody who's neurotypical, right? Um, so for instance, trying to potty train a one-year-old is really ridiculous. It's a stupid expectation. I use the, I, I hate that word, but I, but I, I it's a really miss informed, uh, to, you know, because a one-year-old, maybe there's some unique one-year-old who can be potty trained, but that's way outside the norm, right? So we don't want to set kids up for failure. We want to set them up for success. So we, we try to teach things that are age appropriate skills. I always get fatutzed when a school puts in an IEP, something that's completely unrealistic and not appropriate for an age level. Like when they'll say, you know, must sit in circle time for an hour for a three-year-old. And you're like, what? On what planet, right? So that's why it's important to do age appropriate things. We're not teaching a three-year-old how to balance a checkbook or access their bank account on a phone, right? But that's something we absolutely would teach an 18 year old. Absolutely. Uh, and we might have to teach a bunch of skills before, so we might end up teaching that when they're 21. But, you know, all of these things. We absolutely would be working with a 14-year-old to be able to order their own meal in a restaurant. That's a, certainly an appropriate thing for a 14-year-old to be working on. Um, but I don't think we necessarily would do that with a 2-year-old, right? Unless we want to teach them just a point, maybe a beginning skill of, you know, which picture do you want? Do you want the hot dogs or the mac and cheese, right? And they could point to it, right? That's a different thing. Uh, but important that we uh, teach these things. Things. These are the things that make a difference in a person's sense of self and their self-esteem and they're like, I can do, right? Um, and those are super important. So that's adaptive skills and that's why people should be talking about it with you or with your child uh, about how we work on these things. Okay, so moving on, we have a question of the day for you. Um, I just turned into an opera singer. I don't know why. Uh, what makes you feel like an adult? I've been having lots of conversations with people lately talking about adulting. That's such a phrase right now. Oh, adulting. Um, and somebody that I just love, respect, and admire turned 18 the other day. And I said, how do you feel? And they were like, I don't feel like an 18-year-old. I, I still feel like a 14-year-old. And I said, oh, that's so funny. Because, you know, the truth is, is that the rest of your life, you're probably going to feel like a 14-year-old. I'm 56, and I feel like a 13-year-old girl. And I remember my grandmother, before she died, said, it's so funny. I know I'm old, but I, I still feel like that 12-year-old girl who, you know, and then she described an event in her life when she didn't know what to do. And man, you know, I marvel at people who just seamlessly transition to adulthood and seem like it's no big deal and they deal with the things in life like the DMV and it's just a thing. You know, it's just, oh, it's just something I do, like making the bed and brushing the teeth, right? I still struggle with those things. I'm like, oh no, I gotta go to the DMV. And you know, it's like an earth shattering event, right? Um, but, uh, what makes you, when, what, like what kinds of things when you do them make you feel like, oh, right, I'm an adult. You know, what makes me feel like an adult now is that, uh, we live in our home and when you go to get a glass in our home, there is a cabinet that is just for glassware and it all, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to say, I'm going to call myself out as a liar. I was going to say it all matches. It kind of doesn't right now because we're between two sets of glasses. But for the longest time when I was a college student and as a graduate student and then afterwards, you know, I had this mishmash of glasses and I remember going to a friend's house and she was already adulting, right? And I went to get a glass and I opened up the cabinet and she had the matching set of the juice glasses and the glasses and, you know, and she had wine glasses and I was like, oh, look at you, you're an adult. I don't know why that's my litmus test, but I now feel like an adult because I have, you know, we don't ever drink wine, but if in case we have somebody come over, we have a cabinet that has some wine glasses. They don't all match. Uh, we have like a set of four of this and a set of four of that and whatever. Uh, but it, they're all like in cabinets in the place and we go, that's where we keep the glasses. 
I don't know why that makes me feel like an adult, but it does. So what makes you feel like an adult? And let's stop and consider for a moment that every single individual who's on the autism spectrum deserves to have that feeling. And I don't know why we have to say that, but we do. I just saw Joanne Lara speak uh, two weeks, no, a week and a half ago uh, at the American Icon Award, and she talked about how every individual on the autism spectrum deserves the right to have a seat at the table and to have a job, and that, you know, we all need to make that a reality for them because they deserve that. And, and man, she has made sure that that has gotten into my head. They, you know, that's a reality. So they get to feel like an adult and feel as much as any of us do, right? Um, so that feeling that you get when you're like, oh, I'm an adult and I can do this and I can handle that. Let's think about how we can give that to our kiddos on the spectrum. So what is our topic for the week? Our topic is dun, da, 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 uh, the power of being independent. And the truth is, is that when you teach those adaptive skills to an individual who doesn't have them, whether they're a person on the spectrum, not on the spectrum, when someone, when, when kiddos learn to be able to toilet themselves and zip up their own pants, you will hear that phrase uh, from neurotypicals. They go, I can do it, right? Sometimes for our kids on the spectrum, they don't do that with the hands. Sometimes they will, you know, push somebody away because they don't have the words for it, but it is still the same. It's, I can do that. I am the captain of my own person. I am capable of dealing with that. I am a capable person. We need to make sure that we give that to all of our, all of our kiddos, all of our teens, all of our adults. They deserve it. It is their right. Yesterday I was listening to NPR for just a moment. And as uh, I think it was Steve Inskeep on NPR, he was saying, well, next up we have Koki Roberts and we're talking about uh, women's rights and women were granted the right to vote in, you know, 1919 and Koki Roberts came in on her mic and she was like, excuse me, excuse me. That is not the right way to say that. Nobody granted us the right. We had the right to vote because we were citizens. It was acknowledged that we were citizens and people and could vote in 1919, but men didn't grant it to us. Let's be clear. And I was like, go Koki. And it's the same thing for people on the autism spectrum. They already deserve that. We just need to get with the program. Nothing is wrong from their end and we are not granting them the ability to do their adaptive skills. We're helping them to find their way to it because it is their right, right? Anyway, we got a big show for you today. Uh, in just a couple of seconds, we have the amazing Bonnie Yates, who's going to be talking about legal matters with you. And then a little bit later on in the show, we have one of the co-creators of Spec Laboratories uh, is going to be with us, Jason. Uh, and I'm going to mess up his last name, Weisbro. Uh, I hope that's close in, in the neighborhood, but he is going to be here with us to talk about this year's SpecFest. I've been to them. They're amazing. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about a movie that he's been uh, a part of and working on that there is a GoFundMe for. So all of that coming up after these messages. Stick with us. Logan Shepard. At first glance, he looks like a typical American teenager. He plays in a band, loves hanging out with his friends, he doesn't like doing homework, and he's not really fond of broccoli. But Logan Shepard is not your typical 14-year-old. Logan was diagnosed with autism at the age of two. He was nonverbal, made no eye contact, and his parents were told to abandon all hope. Instead, his parents began an intensive intervention treatment. At its center was a quality ABA program known as the CARD method. This is Logan Shepard now. All I really want to say is like, I'm kind of copying Martin Luther King. I kind of have a dream like that one day, like I can just like inspire people and never give up. Cause like, that's what I want to do in life. Cause if I can succeed, they can succeed and I will succeed.
To follow Logan's musical journey, visit www.facebook.com slash official drummer rock or at drummer rock on Instagram. For more information on the card method, visit www.centerforautism.com or call 800-345-CARD. Rock on, Logan. Welcome back. We are back, and we are so excited to be back with the fabulous Bonnie Yates. She is a special education attorney extraordinaire. Uh, looking sharp, Bonnie. And uh, we're thrilled to have her on a regular basis. And um, Bonnie comes to us from the law firm of Here G and Chow. So, Bonnie, welcome back. And um, can you tell the folks a little bit about Here G and Chow and give the disclaimer, please? I can tell everybody a little bit about here, Jean Chow. Thank you for having me back. Welcome to the heart of IEP season. Here, yeah. Jean Chow is a special education and disability discrimination law firm. We also do regional center and uh, disability discrimination claims. Uh, we're located in Culver City. Our phone number is 310-391-0330, and our website is www lawyer number four so lawyer for children dot com uh, the disclaimer is we're giving you general information about your rights under California and federal law it's not specific information uh, particular to your legal rights in a given situation so if you have a specific legal problem you can certainly ask about it here over the air but ultimately that would not be a substitute for a consultation with a licensed attorney. And we refer you to www.copacopaa.net for a list of special ed attorneys in the 50 states. Fabulous, that was wonderful. Okay. And so uh, okay. we, we do have some questions, but we wanna continue on with talking with LRE. Um, and I've got the questions here. Shall I read the first one? Yeah, I, okay. I, you can read them and I'm, re I'm ready to respond to all the questions. You're not so gonna? The first no, I am. I am. Okay. So the, the, the first the first question is essentially a charter school question, okay. right? You want to read the question? Yes. It is, I'm being told that if I put my child in a charter school, they won't be able to have an IEP. The charter school is in LAUSD. Do you know if that is true? And if it is, what happens to my child's goals and accommodations? Do we get something else? Okay, so charter schools are their own unique animal, and each school has its own charter, and different schools are chartered by different school districts. With that, and, and I mean, one of the big issues with charters and, and, and sort of the semi-privatization of them, in my experience, there have been two issues that have been frequent with charter schools. One is that you tend to get an elected board in there, and, and then um, sometimes their interests are not the same as the interests of the larger school. It can be like a power base for launching yourself into some other political career. But that said, the other issue with charter schools is no unions. Some people don't like unions. I happen to think that the, the teachers union in our public schools is, a, is an important thing to have. Um, but as far as IDEA goes, if you take your IEP to a charter school, the charter school gets the same federal money as the other public schools do, and so they um, are required to abide by IDEA. Sometimes when you get to a charter school, there's not a lot of awareness about special education in the IEP process. That can be a good thing, because sometimes they're actually a lot less hostile, but they also typically will tell parents, we don't have to do any of this, and then you have to educate them. But you should have all of the same rights under the IDEA at a charter school as you do in a regular public school. There are, of course, some more nuanced situations that come up in particular charters, but that the general rule is if somebody's telling you go away, you can't come here because you have an IEP, that's wrong, wrong, wrong. Okay. Uh, next question. My child has been struggling in school for three years. No one ever said anything about autism. Now they are telling us we should get him tested and maybe he goes to a special school. They tell me kinder teacher had recommended this, but no one told me. How can they do this? I, I don't trust them, but I want what is best for my child. What can I do now? Okay, so when I read this question, I wrote down next to the question, child find and hiding things. So preliminarily, 
I can't tell whether this person was in the public school um, before kindergarten, but I guess she wouldn't have been if she doesn't have an IEP. So maybe she's now in third grade or something, third or fourth grade. Um, in all kinds of uh, situations, in public school, parents are the last to know. Um, I had one this week where uh, a student got in a fight with another student. He's a second grader. The only reason his mom found out anything is because um, he told his mom. I sent an expert to a school observation. The kid had a complete and total meltdown right before the observation. The classroom teacher didn't say anything about this to the psychologist doing the observation. Mom only found out because her uh, child's aide told her about it. So. The problem is that there are many, many issues that public school officials have to deal with every day at school, and I think there's sort of a culture of the less we tell parents about what's going on, the less work we have for ourselves. So that's just a general observation. It's not even what I mean to say about the child fine. But what I mean to say about the child find is that under the IDEA, districts need to search out and serve children within their geographical boundaries that have disabilities. And so in this case, somebody obviously missed the boat. If you're getting diagnosed with autism at age seven or eight, the district is going to be liable for two years, which is a statute of limitations in California, of compensatory education because autism isn't something... Autism, Autism isn't a mushroom, you know, like it rains one day and you sprout out of a log. Autism is, is something that is diagnosable, you know, at birth or after birth or certainly by the third birthday. So the district blew it and you need to get a lawyer because they're going to owe you a bunch of services. And what was the rest of the question? Well, you know, what can I do now? And so getting a lawyer and, and getting a bunch of services to to help the child get caught up? I mean, I didn't hear the person saying that she had an assessment. So the other thing I would have her do if her insurance will provide for it is to get the diagnosis of autism confirmed. Yeah. And then, of course, there's a whole world of things that you have to do. You have to educate yourself about autism. And um, an organization like CARD has many, many resources up at its website for how you educate yourself about autism. There's an old book that I like. It was given to me when I was just learning about autism. It's called Let Me Hear Your Voice. It is um, written under a pseudonym. It's about a woman that had two children with autism and her foray into the world of behavior intervention and triaging her children. Um, I believe Doreen Grandpache is in the book as a young student who was coming up the ranks about to do something amazing in the field of autism. So even though it's an old book, I think it provides a lot of context. And I think you have to be careful if your child's just getting a diagnosis of autism because there's so much information out there. You really need help figuring out what to pay attention to. So that's why I think the website that CARD has with Skills Live and some of the other things that you've made available to people is huge because it's good information, not bad information. So you have to deal with the school and you have to you have to deal with the school from the vantage point of making sure that you're asking for a research based appropriate intervention by a trained team as opposed to what the school district will just throw at you if you're not informed. So there's a lot of money on the line for you and you're not going to be able to exploit your situation optimally unless you're represented, so you need to get a lawyer. Okay. All right. Moving on to the next question. Can you tell me what accommodations to ask for for a high school student with high-functioning autism who's only been homeschooled and will now go to public high school? He needs help with planning. Okay. I jotted some things down. Okay. General things that I think would be good. Um, they're not a substitute for, you know, having a specific professional that works with your child to give you more kind of particularized ideas, but here's some things that I think could help. Um, it's important for the routine to be predictable and not too complicated. Um, that becomes important when somebody's moving around from classroom to classroom, which I think might be happening if this is a high-functioning student who's in general ed for his school day or parts of his school day. So you need a predictable routine. You probably need a visual schedule, or you may need a visual schedule. And, and, and at transitions, whether they're 
from class to class or end of day or beginning of day or whatever, probably um, priming for the transitions would be helpful, um, potentially from the uh, teacher. Um, maybe extra time on tests, maybe taking your test in a separate room, um, maybe preferential seating. Um, the questions there would be, do you need to sit near the, dis the, the teacher? Do you need to sit somewhere where it's quiet? Do you need to sit near a particular peer? But issues of seating, that would be an appropriate accommodation. Um, what kind of visual supports do you need? Do you need a graphic organizer? Do you need a content or curriculum outline? Do you need graph paper for math? Do you need manipulatives for math? Do you need modeling for math? Um, do you need individual or small group instruction uh, within the, the larger classroom? Um, do you need to be given accommodations in terms of different ways you could respond to requested information? Sometimes you might um, respond orally, sometimes you might respond in writing, uh, those kinds of things. Um, do you need your materials highlighted? Uh, to focus on the main points or the main task? Do you need a note taker? Do you need assistive technology? Do you need large print? Some students have trouble transferring information from like the test page to the Scantron bubble page. Do you need an accommodation that says you can write your answers directly on the test page so you don't have to transfer it? You probably need reinforcers to encourage you to keep trying really hard. So you need a, you need a, um, a reinforcer assessment to figure out what reinforcers work for you, and then you need a reinforcement system that can be implemented as part of a behavior support plan. You need study guides. Um, and, and I want to point out that modifications are different from accommodations. The writer in of the question asked for accommodations. I don't know whether she really meant accommodations and modifications or just accommodations, but modifications are different. They actually involve changing the curriculum to make it more accessible for someone. So do you need your materials adapted? Do you need a lower reading uh, level? Do you need testing adaptations? We talked about that with the Scantron form. Do you need a reduction of class time assignments or homework assignments so you're you know, getting fewer problems? Do you need an alternate curriculum so that actually you're doing modified work that's less difficult? Do you need a system of pass-fail grading based on work completion rather than grades based on you know, test taking and work uh, completion? So those were some of the ideas for accommodations for high functioning high school students with, um, with disabilities. That's a, great, with high -functioning autism. that's a great list. We should type that up. Um, I might put on somebody on that. Okay, and then the last question, and then we'll have a few minutes to talk about LRE. Can you ask, Bonnie, what do you do when the principal tells you at the IEP that your child has to go to a school one hour away because they don't have a program for your child at his school? My son is about to start kindergarten, and he went to a mainstream preschool. How can he say he has no program? A general comment for you, ladies and gentlemen, when you're writing in, is to try to give me a few more facts. Okay. Um, sometimes I'm guessing a little bit. Um, so I don't know where you live. I don't know if you live in a rural area. I don't know um, that. But what I do know is your child was in a general ed preschool. And so the presumption in the law, which just kind of nicely folds into our discussion about least restrictive environment is the presumption is that you would go to kindergarten in general ed. The presumption is that if you had support in the form of ABA therapy in your preschool, that would follow you into kindergarten. Um, I can't imagine why the principal says there's no general education kindergarten available for the student at the school. Sounds like he's trying to force the kid out because he doesn't want to have to budget for the student's disability related expenses um, and so you probably belong there and you probably need a lawyer who's going to be able to advocate for you at the IEP. The question with placements that are far away, we've covered it a little bit on this show before, but the question is um, when is a, a placement or a transportation route or something um, 
so far away that it becomes a denial of faith? And the answer to that is it's looked at on a case-by-case basis. So, you know, if you are living in Los Angeles and you're being asked to trek out an hour away for school and it's not your choice to do so, that's probably going to get scrutinized in a different way than if you live in the Central Valley where people live in rural areas and the distances between things are greater. But that's not really your question. Your question is really a denial of the least restrictive environment. Why can't your son go to kindergarten at his home school just the way um, other students do? A right. Uh, so, and, and that does dovetail into where do we pick it up with LRE? All right, and, so and here's we have where we about, pick up with LRE. Got, just so you know, we've got about four minutes. All right. So we've been talking about the law related to least restrictive environment and the presumption, particularly for a young person who's just starting school, that he's going to be able to be educated with his normal peers with supplementary aids and services. That's essentially what the LOVAS model was, as I was taught it. You put your child in a preschool, a normal preschool, so he can model, you know, appropriate behavior and language from typical peers, and he, of course, has to have intensive ABA support for the entire time he's there. And so for this child in the last question, um, the, the law would say that when trying to figure out what the least a restrictive environment for him would be, you look at what he's done last. And I just went to an IEP like this last Friday where the child was in a private preschool. He had his ABA funded through his insurance. He was making progress in the preschool, but the preschool teacher and the BCBA who supervised his case both came to the IEP and said, he's making progress in the general ed, but there's no way he could do this if you take his aid away. That's essentially the situation that I think the, the listener or the writer in her of the last um, question is dealing with. And so the burden would be on the district to prove that least restrictive environment is something else. And the fact that it's so far away is a consideration. Um, I it sounded as if the parent hasn't visited the placement yet. And so, so we don't, don't know, know what's, what's being offered instead. instead. But anyway. The law's on your side, and last week I sent Shannon um, an outline from, or actually a chapter from Special Education Rights and Responsibilities, which deals with least restrictive environment so that you can, you know, comprehensively um, learn about it. But where we left off was talking about the balancing of factors that need to occur to determine whether or not a student with disabilities is allowed to be educated in the general ed setting with supplementary aids and supports. And as you can imagine, districts haven't liked this idea, so they've come up with rationales for why um, it shouldn't be permitted, which is wrong, wrong, wrong. But one of the rationales was disruption to the teacher. And the case law says, you know, just the fact that the teacher needs to spend extra time with the student, that in and of itself doesn't prove that it's an undue burden. So then they said, well, we're concerned because the student's not getting substantial educational benefit. They should be in a special day class. Um, so uh, the law on that point is also clear. They need to get some educational benefit. It doesn't have to be substantial educational benefit because in the early years, kindergarten through third, the law looks at social development and, and exposure to typical peers as being so important that educational progress for a while can take a back seat. As the student gets older and the balancing um, continues, the balancing of factors continue, um, disruption to the class and lack of educational benefit are given more weight. So your best time to get your child started in general ed is in kindergarten. And to some extent, if you go into a special day class in kindergarten, it's going to be hard to get out of there, irrespective of what should happen. So that's just something um, to know. Um, the idea is that presumption in favor of mainstreaming requires that a disabled student be educated in a regular classroom if the student can receive a satisfactory education there, even if it is not the best educational setting for the child. Moreover, the determination of whether a child will make progress toward IEP goals must be made in the context of whether she will make progress if 
supplementary aids and services are offered to support the student in the regular classroom. Um, should I keep going? Uh, yeah, one, we got one more minute. Do you think you can fit something okay. in for so one the more next, minute? The next question is, does the district have to provide aids and services to assist my child's uh, integration? What if the district says that providing those aids and services is too expensive? Well, the answer is that's secretly what they're thinking in their heads, but they're not allowed to say it, and they're not supposed to be allowed to use that as a determinant of whether you need supplementary aids and services. The determining factor is if you have those supplementary aids and services, e.g. intensive ABA, um, therapy and supervision, will you be able to access the curriculum in the general ed environment? And that could be with the accommodations and modifications that we talked about before. So the law, the law is the district must provide supplementary aids and services to accommodate the special education needs of students with disabilities in integrated environments. The court in Oberti versus Board of Education stated that a district must take meaningful steps to include students with disabilities in regular classrooms with supplementary aids and services. In another federal appellate court decision, Daniel R.R. versus El Paso Independent School District, the court said, the law does not permit states to make mere token gestures to accommodate handicapped students. Its requirement for modifying and supplementing regular education is broad. So maybe we should stop there. Okay. Uh, all of that is so important because I think it's one of the biggest questions we get asked by parents is, uh, you know, that the school presumption is that they're going to go to a special day program and sometimes that is an hour away. And right. parents want to know, how do I get to be in my home school with an aid in a, in a gen ed classroom? And this, this is the, the path. If you read the LRE chapter that I sent you, I think the reason it's so valuable is because what it's telling you is the default is general ed with supplementary aids and services. So that's what you should be offered. And if they aren't offering it, the burden is on them to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that there's some reason they can't accommodate you in general ed. And the other problem we have, and this is a sad topic and I don't want to alienate people or be, you know, not respectful of the efforts that professionals are making to educate our kids. Sure. But there, the notion that a special day class is going to be the appropriate environment for your child has to be looked at carefully. Absolutely. because. More, more often than not, the standards in a special ed class are low. And I'm sorry to say that because I wish it weren't true, but it is. So people like me are trying our darndest to keep people in general ed for as long as we can for that reason. Okay. I absolutely agree. I concur. Thank you much, so much, Bonnie. Tell us again how we can right. get a hold of Hirji and Chow. 310-391-0330. Uh, There's been a little calm in the storm. If you're in Southern California and you want an intake, give us a call. Okay. If you need help and you're elsewhere, please send your questions in and refer to COPA. And thank everybody for listening. Wonderful. And have a wonderful Memorial Day, Bonnie. I shall. All right. You too. Thank All you right. very much. Bye-bye. Uh, okay, we're taking a quick break, and then we are getting Jason from the from Spec Labs in to talk about Spec Fest. So stick with us. In other news tonight, it's a one-of-a-kind festival that can only be found actually here in Los Angeles. It's called Spec Fest. This is a film and music festival dedicated to artists who are on the autism spectrum. Organizers say it kind of gives a voice to those who would otherwise be unheard. And there's nothing else like this. There's people who do, you know, little things here and there. But as far as a community event where everybody gets together to see real original work that's like the talent in the autism community is amazing. So something that showcases at such a professional grand scale is it's nowhere else found in Los Angeles. And organizers say they would love to expand the festival to other cities. You can listen to and purchase the artist's albums at speclabs.org.
welcome back. I just I can't help but like grin and stare. <laughs> uh, so you just saw that, and we have live in the studio the, the, who you saw on the clip, Jason Weisbrod, and you are the co-creator uh, and, and president of Spec Labs, mm -hmm. an amazing, an amazing group, uh, and we're so thrilled to have you back to talk about Spec Fest. Yes, I'm so happy to be back, Shannon. It's always a thrill I to love have being you here. here. Um, yeah, we have Spec Fest. Spec Fest is coming up, but you've been to a couple of them yes, already, and uh, this is our sixth. Wow! So we've been in operation for five years, but our first year we were we were like, let's do two Spec Fest. So we did two <laughs> our first year, so this is our sixth Spec Fest. Um, once a year, we do an annual music, film, animation, visual arts festival, showing all the talent and creative work that's uh, being done at. Oh, so we're, all we're all good. Okay. Uh, but so uh, it's an amazing thing. And let's back up just a little bit to talk about where it's born out of. Okay. Because for people who don't know about Spec Labs, uh, what what that is. Um, yeah, Spec Labs started with myself and Garth Herberg, who's my co-founder and music genius creative. The um, two of you together are just like wild talent. <laughs> well, we're both a little, you know... Both a little out there, and we That's both have That's what talent been, looks like. <laughs> we both have been in the entertainment industry since we were very young. Garth was traveling in bands and doing composing scores for films and doing all this type of music and trying to make it in the music industry. And I was a filmmaker, an actor. I used to do a bunch of commercials and TV shows and movies. And was we were both just kind of sick of the Hollywood entertainment hustle and bustle. Right. And uh, I was working for uh, a lot of years, uh, nine, ten years, all around the nonprofit world and worked a lot with Miracle Project and uh -huh. Elaine and uh, then out of the people I met there and the people I met just through the community and everything, um, I realized how much talent there was and how many of you know people who are now my students and my friends yeah. were telling me back then, oh, I want to make movies, I want to make right. records, I want to be an actor, I want to get out there and be professional. And yeah. so I thought, well, you know, my love of filmmaking and mm -hmm. acting and I was like well maybe I can teach them like what it's really like to make a demo reel and what right. it's really like to go on auditions and do that and you know put yourself out there and it was really when I met Garth um, and we were back friends we knew each other since high school but like we weren't working together and once I got involved with Garth and we started you know talking more and more and Garth was like well, I want to make records mm. I want to actually like these songs are so amazing they come up with let's make a record and yeah. so out of that love of his love of making records and my love of making movies we pretty much and started Spectrum Laboratory which is geared towards getting all these talented folks on the spectrum to work with entertainment professionals yeah. and actually try to create professional high quality stuff put on the internet and see where it goes and you know give them the experience of what it's like to actually Try and to it's make amazing. It. <laughs> so you've got in front of you a bunch of CDs that have come out of the work that you guys have done. You have a bunch of music videos and short videos yeah. and, and things that you've done. And so the way it looks like to me is that you have this amazing pool of talent that takes classes mm -hmm. and then works on projects together and then once once and twice a year you guys have these amazing spec fest things where they get to just bust out and showcase everything that they've been working yeah. on yeah and it's it's a lot i mean this it is a well lot. Our, I'll just for an example our first year uh I'm like i'm slouching um our, <laughs> our first year our first year we had six students yeah. Uh, our first class, we just had a music class and an acting class. Now we have 13 classes. We do everything from a live band, yeah. so uh, live band for performance. We have animation, which Danny Bowman, who oh. we all love, yeah. is teaching our animation classes. So we're in collaboration with Danny Mason Entertainment and Spectrum Laboratory. Um, at this Spec Fest, we're going to show a bunch of animation yeah. from her and her team. Um, uh, there's a, one of our students is showing her first fully animated short film that's like four minutes long it's amazing the indiana cheese muncher by zoe and uh so danny's got a bunch of animation on garth's side there's we every year we pump out a new record yeah. like this was our record from last year which was my heart um and then a lot of our solo artists have their own records like this is lucas saluski's solo record dominique's amazing. got his solo record um, we're putting out an EP by Rio, Soul Shaka oh, Wiles. Uh, we're doing, um, we have a couple new students uh, that are getting their first time ever to go on stage and show wow. their songs. 
plus we do our live band. Um, and then on the film side, there's music videos, there's short films. This year we're actually, we put together a TV pilot. So we wrote a whole half hour TV pilot. Oh of course gosh. I couldn't shoot a whole half hour TV pilot, but what right. I did was I took like little moments of it right. and put little scenes together with all the students from my Tuesday film production class. And we're cutting together like a pilot pitch. I and we created it. a music video because it's a musical TV pilot oh. show. Like in like if Glee was to meet, I'll do a Hollywood pitch. Right. If like Glee was to meet Atypical, you know, was to I meet like a, so it's like a musical dramedy okay. is kind of. So it's more, it's not just like all campy and fun. So it's, it's really tackling a lot of the, what it's like to be autistic and be in high school and go through these emotions. And a wow. lot of the, their emotions are come out through song. I love whereas it. Whereas they can't express themselves like that, you know. Yeah. And it's called Let Us Be Heard, which is our, our logo, our kind of thing. So yeah. We're going to show that at SpecFest, like what we did with that. It's so, I, now, so I've gotten to go to the last two spec fests because for the longest time I couldn't come because you always, you have the one that's this time of year right around my son's birthday. Oh yeah. And so it's yeah. almost, it's either on his birthday or during his birthday party or whatever. And I'm always like, guys, mm. can we work together? I might be able to come on the fourth. He won't be able to come because he's got to study for finals. So, you know. Yeah, this, <clears> this year, we've always done it uh, at a different space. So this is the first time. Uh, we actually got a really legitimate, amazing venue. It's the El Rey Theater. Oh, yes. Which you saw our music showcase. Yes. We had a record release party at the El Rey Theater. And Tom Kenny came, the oh, voice of SpongeBob was, SquarePants. And we he were live. Performed from, with, yeah, you guys yeah, we, were live we there. We live feed. Uh, he performed. You can see him with us on, on our website at speclabs.org. He was but amazing. He's also in the movie, Boys Don't Wear Dresses, which we'll talk about yes, in just a second. But uh, Tom Kenny is part of the family. And uh, so the El Rey Theater... Uh, which, which I've had beautiful. a long relationship with them because I've worked with them, and finally I got them to yeah. to give us the space, which is incredible. So we're going to have a real music venue. The band's going to be oh. performing on stage, and then we're going to get a big HD screen to show all the films. Oh, fabulous. Um, so we're really excited to be at the El Rey, and it's on June 4th. So Well, i got to say, 4th. for an audience member, it is like the best party that you could go to. Uh, where you get to see all these young people that are having a party of showing their talents mm. and they are so excited that they vibrate. They literally vibrate and you can't, you, your face hurts because you're having such a good time. And yeah. there's always, like, it breaks out into dancing. I mean, because there's so oh, yeah. already. And parents and, let loose. It's the oh, best. Oh, it's, it's, yeah. it's a party. It's a really yeah. wonderful celebration of being who somebody is and expressing their art. It's absolutely fabulous. And so there's that part mm -hmm. of it. But there's also the part of it where you, where I have gotten to see now these young people grow and develop yeah. their talent, which is like crazy good. But yeah. then there's another part of it that I saw clearly when I came to last year's SpecFest. Um, there, there was one of the movies... See, I said I wasn't going to cry and I put the tissues on the floor. Um, but one of the movies that you showed, I had yeah. such a hard time. I was crying so hard in the back that I had to step out for a second because I was oh. like, I don't want to embarrass myself. But it was happy because it was the one where they were all camping. Yeah, uh, and the it Cheers was, music video. And, and it, there, it's this wonderful song, and you get yeah. to see these young people and how interwoven and that they are friends. Yeah. And that they have this community together of friends that create, and it's the thing that everybody wants for their child. Yeah, that one's Cheers. And we shot that actually where uh, I live. It's, we got everybody together. We did a campfire. We roasted marshmallows. We sang a song. Our really good friend Barry Rose like stepped in and sang and helped us write the song. So that was entertainment professional. She's got you know her own music career. And we wrote this song all together and we went and filmed. I'll tell you, this one might make you cry this round. Uh -huh. um, I took my whole crew uh, to Meals on Wheels. Oh. And we shot a music video uh, with Meals on Wheels, and we delivered food. We had them volunteer. They went through the whole process of checking out the food, making sure it was all there. We went to a senior citizen home, oh, delivered food for <laughs> Meals on Wheels. Spencer oh. uh, sang to this woman, and she cried. I mean, it was... So we have a music video. Right, I have to get for the them. tissues now. <laughs> for them. Uh, so I got them all the Meals on Wheels, and then also I got them to a, a really cool week with another nonprofit called Grown in L.A., we went to this old nursery, 1920s nursery in Griffith Park, uh -huh. and I got a bunch of my students planting, weeding, like learning how to plant 
you know, and to grow soil and learn like good soil planting. And and while we're filming, I'd put on the song and be like, all right, we're singing it. Wow. <laughs> and potting plants. So that's going to show that music video, which I'm really excited about. Um, is going to show and that's called we we can work together or we must work together so that's we're probably going to end the fest with that one because it's so sweet you're young and i'm sure like because i know how much work you put into spec fest i'm sure you're tired usually the week two weeks I'm before, pretty tired right now yeah right <laughs> but you're young you can handle it but i just i have to say what a yeah. great what a great thing you've created Thank what a you. great thing you've created. It must be so much fun for you, but I know how much fun it is for the young people. But, but beyond that, and fun is important. I don't mean to negate that, but they are learning and growing. Yeah. And they have, you have helped them to create. They, I see clearly that none of those kids feel like they're untethered. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I look at poor Dom and what he went through in the last year, yeah. he's a brilliant performer. We've had him here before on the show, and in the same day, he lost his grandmother, and then later that day, his father his died. Dad, yeah. I mean, unbelievable. But Dom has a community. I know yeah. that it's been hard for him, but Dom has a community, and he has a purpose, and he has people gathered around him. And, I, you know, I... If, if he didn't have that, I would be so worried for that young man. Yeah, and he was amazing. I mean, he came right back after that, and I had a lot of conversations with him, and it was basically like, let's create. Like, the only way to get through this is to create and to yeah. write a song and to sh write a script and make yeah. a film. And, and it's since, I mean, and after that, I mean, he's been writing, sending, he sends me almost like once or twice a week just through email scenes for this like mockumentary Aww. movie he wants to make. I and I'm looking it. at it, I'm like, I want to make this with you, but it's like a feature film. I mean, right. he's got big dreams and big visions and he wants to, you know, play yeah. it, be on stage at the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah. I mean, this guy has got such dreams and passions. And yeah, the way he bounced back from that, and it's, it's really a testament to art and community. And yeah. that's what that we must work together, the community, like friendships being born. And that's the whole uh, other part of Spec Labs. Besides the art is like right. the really fun stuff that we get to show. But um, yeah, it's like it's a definite family. I never in my wildest dreams would have thought like how many people are involved now and the size of the family and the community and how everybody just, you know, helps each other out and is there for everybody. And, and to see the parents. I mean, I... Uh, the last time you came, we had Lucas uh, Saluski yeah, on. Yeah, with and, his solo album, yeah. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> uh, what an incredible human being he is. And yeah. just to have the pleasure of, like, getting to see him and talk to him and then watch his art, amazing. Yeah. But then I met his mom for the first time yeah. at SpecFest, and, you know, we had, like, this tearful moment because she just couldn't say enough, enough nice things about you guys and what you have Danielle. done for her You're son. You're the best, Danielle, if yes, you're Yes, uh, we adore her. Yeah. But, um, okay, I, we're running out of time, ah. and so I want to make sure that we yes. get to talk about, but first of all, June 4th. June 4th Spec is Fest. SpecFest. That's, Price to get in? Uh, it's Okay, so it's free admission. It's okay. a fundraiser. So we'll be selling the records. We'll be okay. selling posters, records. It's donation-based. So, okay. Um, so there's you no know, excuse. People should go. Yeah. Uh, it give Because every the money that is generated from that fundraiser goes to scholarshiping all of our students okay. for the next year. So basically, uh, if you buy a record. And also, well, the other thing that we've been saying since we started is all of our proceeds from the records, we share 50-50 with our artists. So it doesn't so, all go to Spec Labs. If you buy the records, um, it goes to the artists who were on the records. Wonderful. And it goes to scholarshiping students. So it's a fundraiser, but it's free to walk in, so you just give whatever... Then whatever you, you can. Whatever you can. Um, okay, yeah, so, and, but you have something else that's coming up. Uh, yes. You mentioned uh, the film. The, so this year we made our our biggest short film we've ever made. Mm -hmm. It was called Boys Don't Wear Dresses. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, based on one of my students, friends, like life. Uh, I've known um, this kid for almost 12, 13, 14 years now. Wow. And uh, now it, he is now an adult and now he is a she. And it's about Stephen Felder's transformation into Alani Shorn. And um, Alani is a beautiful, woman and got together with me and Alani's parents, Len and Linda, are unbelievable. They're mm -hmm. so supportive. And we all got together and said, could we 
write a movie that tackles what it's like to be autistic and transgender. Yeah. And I'm like, I've never heard of anything like that. Yeah. I got emotional. I'm like, you're trusting me with this? And, <laughs> but then I, I wrote it with Alani. So yeah. we, we had mentorships. We sat down together. We wrote it. And we thought the best way to tackle this is to tell it like a Disney modern day tale where it's about the fact that this kid was always told that boys don't wear dresses, mm -hmm. but always wanted to and was scarred from childhood trauma mm -hmm. of trying to put lipstick on or trying to put heels on and other kids making fun. Yeah. And then realizing it's a story of one day in college meeting Spencer Hart is in the uh. movie along with Alani. Um, meeting Spencer, forming a friendship of, of them bonding and then meeting a possible love. Yeah. And just these experiences this character is going through, that's kind of the beginnings of a transformation. Wow. And so the story is about that. It's a beautiful look about the struggles of being autistic and being transgender and how to come out and express yourself and be wow. who you really want to be. And it fits really well with our mission at yeah, Spec Labs, which is let your voice be heard. But then also we got some amazing entertainment professionals. We got Tom Kenny, uh, the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants, to do a cameo in the movie. Love He's actually it. playing the professor, which was the part that was modeled after me. Like in the, <laughs> so I was really I was directing Tom Kenny, <laughs> like to play me, which was really surreal because I've loved Tom Kenny my whole life well, since he was course. Mr. Show. And I mean, he was in the Smashing Pumpkins Moon video. It was him oh. and his wife Jill. Like they were the young couple in the wow. the old Tonight Smashing Pumpkins video. But I mean, I've loved Tom Kenny forever, and he's seriously the best human being ever. I love him and he, he was part of our record release party. And then the biggest, most amazing thing is when we wrote the stepmom character, I was like, oh, I was watching Transparent so much at the time. And yeah. I looked at Lonnie and I was like, oh man, Alexandra Billings for Transparent. It's like, let's think about her as the yeah. stepmom and write it like if she was, you know, this, because her, her face and everything and her hair back, she just has this like strict yeah. like demeanor of like right. strength. And she's so strong and so passionate, and we got her. That's and amazing. she actually, through our casting director, Rose, who works on Atypical, because uh -huh. some of our students, Dom and Spencer, and yeah. are on Atypical, there's all this networking and pulling strings and everything happened. And so we got Tom Kenny, we got Alexandra Billings uh, in the film. Um, we're going to be submitting it to Sundance and to all the film Love festivals. It. For 2020, so I'm editing it right now. But at Specfest on June 4th, you'll see the trailer, the trailer okay. for the film. Okay. And next, a week from tonight, oh no, Monday. Uh, yes. Well, I'm, it's my okay. So <laughs> Thursday night, yes, we are having the trailer. Uh, no, not the trailer. Let me take that over again. Thursday night, we're having a bingo charity fundraiser for the film Boys Don't Wear Dresses, which I can see is behind me. It's at Hamburger Mary's in West Hollywood. It's Thursday night, May 30th at 7 p.m. And you, you can play RSVP. bingo? You buy bingo cards. It's like $20 a bingo card, and uh -huh. that goes to the movie, the Wonderful. fundraising. And there's prizes, and they do this whole show. It's hilarious. It's okay. so funny. And it's all ages. Like, you can bring kids because there's food and everything. That sounds like so a good time So it's to super me. fun. It's going to be awesome. Um, you'll get to meet... The, some of the cast, and uh, I'll be there, and we're all going to have a good time. Um, so if you can, come support the, the film. And uh, I guess yeah, the last... Keep, keep that up there for The just last a little there. thing is... Uh, so May 30th, 7 p.m. May 30th, 7 p.m. Okay. Um, yeah, come support the film. And then also my friend, the Pegasus, just <laughs> wanted I... to make a... A guest appearance. Uh, he's been dying to be on this show. He's so he precious. loves you, Shannon. And, and I love uh, him back. he he's really excited because he actually made a guest appearance in another one of our music videos that you can <laughs> see at Specfest called Welcome to My Wonder World. And uh, he, he he's never been in one of our music videos. This was his first chance. And uh, you know, I'm just he really proud you. of him. He's just always wanted to be involved with Spec Labs and be in a music video. So you can see him in Welcome to My Wonder World. And, uh, you guys have the most fun on June 4th. of yeah. any people. So June 4th for uh, Specfest, June but, 4th for Specfest. but May 30th, May 30th for the bingo. For the bingo night. So back to back, Thursday 30th, bingo <laughs> night, not Tuesday, June 4th, Specfest. And I'm sure you're not editing anything right now. I'm, <laughs> I'm going home and editing with <laughs> my really good friend Luis, who, right? who is, uh, wants to come on here to talk about his film we're going to make together. Uh, he absolutely um, can. The trailer for Michael Anthony's movie is going to be showing. He wants to, we're going to come on and show the trailer. At I've the been telling Michael and, Anthony that he could come on for a long time. And yeah. Luis has actually been on the show before, and yeah. he'll be on again. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so we're always creating, but yeah, I'm going to go home and edit and... Um, <laughs> 
I know it's. I know you don't have so anything cute. to do. He's yeah. precious. What is his name? Oh, this is just the Pegasus. The, the Pegasus. He just he just likes to be called the Pegasus. The Pegasus. Yeah, because in the song, it's all about flying high like a Pegasus. I love it. I love what you guys do. <laughs> Thank you. And, uh, is the, so are there any other play? Isn't there like a GoFundMe also for the film? Oh, yeah. For Boys Don't Wear Dresses also, there's a GoFundMe. If you just go to GoFundMe and type in Boys Don't Wear Dresses, it'll come up. And we've, we're always uh, having that up because we're going to have to submit to all the film festivals. Yes. And we cost. still have some production, post-production costs as okay. far as um, Danny's doing animation on the film. So I got a bunch wow. of my students doing animation, and we're, you know, we're constantly trying to uh, just raise awareness and acceptance for that film and spread it out. And the more the more money we raise, basically, the more film festivals we can submit to and try to get the film seen all over the world next year. I'm just so glad you're on the planet and you and Garth <laughs> together and that you're doing what you're doing. I think yeah. it's remarkable. Thank you. I'm so glad. Mm -hmm. All right, so check out. And, and if they just want to know more about Spec Labs, what's at Spec Labs? Ah, uh, yes. It is <laughs> www.speclabs.org. <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right. We are officially out of time, but um, I want to thank you for being here. We want to thank Bonnie thank you, Yates baby. for being here. We hope everybody has a wonderful, happy, safe Memorial Day. Yeah, happy Memorial and, Day. Uh, check us out this entire week. We're going to have some amazing shows for you. Uh, we will be back tomorrow, but until then, give your kiddos a hug for me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now.